Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Joe Hawk. I am here to welcome you to the last session and the closing ceremony of the school-based mentoring showcase. We have a, a presentation by my colleague on everyday mentoring because every moment matters. Next slide. Next slide. There, Steve. Yes. Um, because because of the okay i'm gonna have to do a from over here there we go okay you can keep going they, they don't need to look at me all right i have uh before we start i'd like to read a disclaimer and go over a few housekeeping points the views expressed today are those of the participants and and the the presenters and may not necessarily represent those of the governor's prevention partnership the information is provided the information provided is meant solely for educational purposes and the governor's prevention partnership is not liable for any outcomes related to the implementation of the materials presented here today next slide housekeeping uh, this is a meeting in zoom so we ask you to mute your microphones and silence your cell phones if if you're not on mute uh, today's key oh, i'm sorry there's a mistake here today's session and closing uh, ceremony will run for approximately an hour and a half an hour and 15 minutes excuse me and it is being recorded to be hosted on our website or for future use. I, I know that Aristide does a very interactive presentation, but um, there will be a QA and a if time is permitting at the end of the session today. Next slide. I'd like to introduce Aristide Hill. He's a program manager of all things mentoring at the Governor's Prevention Partnership and he is uh, an expert in everyday mentoring. So we're very pleased to have him here to lead our session. Aristide. Thank you, Joe. And I just wanna start by saying, um, I am so grateful to be here with all of you to talk about mentoring. And this has just been a great workshop day. Um, it, it has a really big feeling to me. And so, uh, especially during this time to talk about uh, relationships with a purpose, um, which we call mentoring, uh, it's just something to be said about how um, all of you showed up to uh, participate um, as being in the audience and also just giving great information and for our team at the Governor's Prevention Partnership to be able to put this together. Uh, I, I am really, really uh, in awe of this. And so I'm going to go ahead and start to talk about um, our workshop today, Everyday Mentoring. And so we're gonna just begin on where did this come from? Where did this concept of everyday mentoring start? So uh, the Mentoring Partnership of Southwest PA was established in June of 1995. Uh, just like us, it's an affiliate of the National Mentoring um, Partnership Mentor, and they're the leader of everyday mentoring. So they came up with this concept of really looking at how to impact young people uh, with everyday mentoring and how to kind of recruit people to become um, from an informal mindset to a formal mindset. And so we're gonna go ahead and um, explore that. So the question is, what is everyday mentoring? Um, children thrive uh, when they are surrounded by caring adults in all areas of their lives, in their homes, neighborhoods, schools, and communities. Everyday mentoring recognizes that caring adults everywhere can make a difference in youth in their daily lives. We all know how desperately youth need to be, need a caring, supporting adult in their lives. Even the most well-loved children benefit tremendously from the guidance, caring, and involvement of coaches, crossing guards, teachers, neighbors, librarians, police officers, businessmen. And that's really the crux of what everyday mentoring is all about, is bringing those people that I have, those mentor-like behaviors, doing it every single day and helping them with training to help them with formalized mentoring relationships. Most of us have stories about how important adults are in our lives when we were young. Uh, and so what we need is a thoughtful listener, someone who has inspired us and those adults who gave us advice and a chance to be our better selves. 
And so that's what everyday mentoring is. We can be that adult in the life of a young person. Every day we have the chance and the opportunity and the privilege of making consistent and perhaps subtle differences in a child's life in the moments we are with them. And each day, every day we make a subtle difference. We're opening a door, carving out a new path, demonstrating to a child that we are indeed great people. Oh, let me go back. And so how does everyday mentoring happen? And so when you see here is the Search Institute and they came up with some 40 development assets and, and this is where everyday mentoring shines. It's taking some of that information and able to share it with uh, people um, that have relationships with young people. So the first one here is express care. Show that you like me and you want the best for me. Challenge growth, insist that I try continuously to improve, uh, provide support, help me complete tasks and achieve goals, which is so important for mentors to be able to do. And it's the number one reason why young people uh, can really shine. Share power is a concept uh, we're gonna explore today. Hear my voice and let me share in making decisions, expand possibilities, expand my horizons and connect me to opportunities. So when we go through this workshop today, and as we, we explore everyday mentoring, this is gonna be a broad overview of something that if you're interested at the end of this, uh, we can come and tailor this to your program, to your association, to your affinity group. And so this is a high level um, and the first rollout really of everyday mentoring. And so we're looking forward to sharing this with you in the very near future, but this is how it happens every day. And so what does everyday mentoring look like? Although we have different experience of who mentors are, broadly speaking, a mentor is someone who invests time and attention into getting to know us, sees the best in us, and encourage us by passing on life lessons and helping us grow in our potential. And for me, I'm a storyteller, so I get a great big kick out of sharing my um, experience with young people, sharing those stories. And you know something? When, when I don't think they're listening, they always remind me of the things that I, I spoke with them about. And so all of us can tell stories. And I think that I encourage all of you to do the same. So being a mentor is something we can inspire um, to be uh, for a child to, to have, and we can also inspire in ourselves. By looking at our own experiences, we can use it, attributes and qualities of those who mentor us to help children we can come in contact with every day. You still have a primary responsibility of your role as a teacher, librarian, coach, but there are some kind, there are still those moments, those, those shite, uh, brining shite, uh, we call them brightening star moments that you can share with a young person. And it's just totally something that you and that young person can connect on. By focus on everyday mentoring moments, we can create a culture of mentoring in the region and impact hundreds of thousands of children each day. So how do you impact youth? You know, um, the one thing about everyday mentoring is that we look at, you know, um, when we come in and we, we sit down with a program, we sit down with an organization, a school-based mentoring program, we do what we call a relationship with youth self-assessment. And basically what that is, is just, a SWOT analysis, right? And typically a SWOT analysis is used to assess the entire organization by examining things that are helpful and harmful to achieving the organizational mission goal through both internal strengths and weaknesses and external opportunities and threats lens. So applying a, a SWOT analysis to what you're already doing and then also examine how you can get better is a great way for an organization um, to be able to look at what this everyday mentoring concept could look like and also to really see around corners in those blind spots and also uh, celebrate those things that you're already doing. So what could your organization do to support stronger youth adult relationships? And you see here the strengths, weakness, opportunities and threats. And we explore that when we really sit down with your organization. If you're even thinking about 
uh, implementing everyday mentoring. And we go through that through a series of exercises that take about an hour or so just in of itself. But it's a great tool and opportunity uh, to start that path, start that mission of encouraging young people. And so here we have uh, a picture. It says, what about a boy? So what do you think? You can assume based on your observations from these two photos, um, what do you see? What inf information do you get from these photos about these children? So in the chat, or you can raise your hand, you know, what do you see when you see these two photos? And what, what, what is your first reaction on the one on my left, uh, the, young, the young man uh, with the, um, with the suit on, and then on my right, the young men that are looking at something. You know, you can put it in the chat, or you can also, um, you can also just raise your hand and, and say something. So I don't see anything in the chat so far. So what this exercise is meant to do is just, it's a process question. So how do we get to know the whole person and not just what observable on the surface? So when we see those things, we see a lot of things that we can make a lot of assumptions, right? For young people. But it's really, we really wanna get to the deeper um, below the surface level of what a young person is. And that's what everyday mentoring really highlights. And that's something that uh, we talk about when we uh, do this exercise. So some of the key takeaways with this is that we need uh, to be aware of the assumptions that go along with the observations we make about youth's visible characteristics. Uh, we need to uh, we need to be particularly careful about assumptions related to race, gender, and social economic background. One or more of these will likely differ between um, differ between any young person that we have interactions with. These judgments can get in the way of building trusting relationships and prevent us from seeing the person as they really are. And one of the things, if you've ever been on a training with me, when we talk about the elements of effective practice, we go through cultural competency, but we really, when we're connecting with young people, want to move beyond cultural competency to really build that relationship to see what those young people are thinking once we take on this mentor-like uh, qualities. And so that is something that we need to do. We also need to be remember that mentees are making assumptions about us as well. So based on our visible characteristics, you may find that you would like to be more understanding and addressing your biases. So please keep an eye out for trainings that we offer. And um, we have some coming up. We have the Essentials Training coming up in June, which talks about beyond cultural competency, uh, mentoring uh, young Black and Latino um, boys of color. And so this is just part of um, the recipe, the secret sauce, I, I would say, on uh, everyday mentoring. So when we talk about everyday mentoring, right, um, we talk about boundaries, right? And boundaries are very important. Um, you know, you could want to have a, you want to have a healthy relationship with a young person, but setting those boundaries are really healthy and really important. So healthy boundaries, healthy relationships, right? So that, that is the equal there. Boundaries are healthy limits we set between ourselves and other people. So boundary areas, time, personal space, private information, belongings, and touch. Very important for mentors to really understand that because when we talk about these things, especially touch, we wanna make sure that we are setting those healthy boundaries and that we are not initiating touch, right? Because it's really something that um, we wanna make sure that we're both on the same page as a young person and also a um, <clears throat> mentor. So here are some questions. Do you feel comfortable communicating with kids outside of work? Saying no to requests for your time? Sharing personal belongings? Showing physical affection? Or sharing stories about your personal life? 
And there's a continuum there. You have always, sometimes, and never. And you got to find, you know, um, what your personal boundaries are going to be. Sometimes oversharing about your personal information is a bit much and it can be a little too much for a young person to take. Uh, and so that's something that we got to consider when we talk about setting our boundaries, because boundaries are healthy limits uh, we set for ourselves and other people. They define who we are and who we are not. Um, what we are comfortable with and what we're not comfortable with. So healthy boundaries equal healthy relationships. We wanna always remember that. Setting and maintaining good boundaries is a good <clears throat> way for most fundamental aspects of creating good relationships. Boundaries all the time are really great when you take your time to get to know the person in making sure that you share only those things that you think a person won't use against you or that you think will harm another person. So setting boundaries when we talk about everyday mentoring is key. And this whole exercise here, there's a lot of um, exercises that we do when we come out to your agency and implement this. And so it's, it's really in depth and just giving you an overview that this is just part of on the entire everyday mentoring toolbox. So why are boundaries so important? Keeps both adults and youth safe, helps establish and nurture trust, provide model for healthy relationships. What are examples of common boundary problems with youth? And this is very important for people to understand. Overemphasize or taking on youth's problems, that can be a challenge and that's a recipe a lot of times for disaster, right? Blurring roles, parent, therapist, or friend, becoming too familiar too quickly. You know, creating relationships takes time, right? And when you think about your own relationships, with the young people that are in your life, it took a little time to get to know them. And so that's something that we wanna emphasize here. Getting into the requests that make you uncomfortable. And we know that young people can <laughs> have some requests that are, are um, um, they wanna maybe turn you into Santa Claus or an ATM. And so if it makes you uncomfortable, it's something to really research and to talk about. So how to communicate personal boundaries, right? Here are some tips. Honor your comfort level and be sensitive to others' comfort levels. Be calm and assertive in your communication. Use I, we, or it instead of you. Try to frame your response positively. So examples of setting language, I really like talking to you, but that isn't something I feel comfortable sharing about myself. That's really good. And I think that when you when you put it that way, a young person can really understand that. I'm feeling frustrated. I need to take a break for a few minutes and then I'll come back. I'm happy to listen, but when you're yelling, that makes it more difficult for me to hear you. Would you be willing to stop yelling so we can work together and solve your problem? I promise to keep conversations private unless I am concerned about your safety. And so many of you might have some great examples. If you wanna throw something in the chat on just how to set those examples, what that expectation looks like for you, that would be something we can do at this time. This is kind of meant to be interactive. Um, I'm glad this is in a meeting format. And so um, that would be awesome if you had some great tips um, or something that you use yourself. Have the chat open. Validate emotions. It's okay to feel like this. That's perfect. And Tracy says, I love these. Thank you. If you're writing notes, you can grab these. These, these are great when we talk about, you know, 
uh, communicating your boundaries. All right, moving right along. And so when, when you ask young people about, you know, what it takes, um, what they look for in a mentor, right? One of the top things is they really value somebody that listens to them. And if you can see here, um, the tra traditional Chinese to listen uh, includes more than just ears, eyes, and body language. It involves our heart and ourselves, our own experience through which we hear another story and our ability to relate with empathy. So you have the, you have the ear, you, eyes, undivided attention, heart. And that comes with a lot, right? There's, there's, there's some other things. And so when we talk about listening and we're using this, this context here, uh, we have reflective listening. Um, it sounds like you might be feeling is, is, a, is a nice phrase. It seems you, it seems like you are, or I'm guessing this feels, uh, and these are, these are great faith, uh, uh, great phrases uh, when we talk about re reflective listening. Focus particularly on the feelings your partner shared with you. You know, try rephrasing the statements. Did I hear you, did I hear this correctly? Uh, let me make sure I understand. So rephrasing is not repeating. It's just making sure that you're getting clarity on what the mentee has said. And it's really something that um, they feel really good about once they know that you're listening to them. So why is being heard so healing? I don't know the full answer to that question. But I do know that it's something to do with the fact that listening creates relationship. And that's from Meg Wheatley turning to one another. And that's very important because all of us, especially as adults, uh, when we have some challenges or we're having a conversation, we feel affirmed when someone is listening to us intently and with sympathy and really leaning in to hear what we're saying. And so when we're talking about this as an activity for everyday, um, everyday mentors, and when we're training mentors to go through this, uh, through the, the series of exercises that accompany this, um, it's going to be a tool that they're going to take away and is really going to impact the lives of, of a lot of young people. So the other thing about everyday mentoring is that we talk about helping you through challenges. So this is a youth and, and this is what they said. And, and, and let me know through the chat or if you raise your hand, if you, if you encounter anything like this with a young pe person that you know. A youth says, I have a paper to write about, but I don't know why I should even bother. The teacher always gives me Ds and Fs. No matter how hard I try, they hate my guts. I think they want me to fail but my mom will kill me if I do. So one of the hardest things in working with young people is dealing with challenging behavior. You are always going to have challenging behavior when you're working with kids. No matter what type of kids you're working with, behavior issues can get in the way of building relationships with kids. It can also lead equally to bad behavior on your, on your part if you're not careful. And so one of the things that, and if you've been through any of the elements trainings that I've done is that the number one perceived reason why relationships fail is that mentors have a perceived, um, a perceived lack of information from their mentee and they don't think their mentee is really into the relationship. So a perceived lack of motivation on the mentee's part and the mentors get disinterested, right? And so with everyday mentoring, we wanna give those mentors the tools to make sure that they don't fall into that trap. We know that youth development is on a spectrum and young people go through a lot. And so these are some challenging behaviors that might occur at different times of a young person's um, youth development. 
And so just like when you remember when you're a young person, there were certain times of the year you had some challenges, especially around tests, getting good grades or going to school. And this is just something that we wanna help uh, mentors um, really get under their feet and really have a solid footing on how to deal with those challenging behaviors. So at this part, when we talk about the overview of everyday mentoring, there is a whole host of exercises that really go through this and mentors can come away with tools to really say, I can do this. I can really help a young person. I didn't understand it before, but I really understand it now. So when we're still talking about um, these behaviors, do you recognize yourself in any of these roles? Eternal optimist. I'm not sure as bad as it seems. I see you're having a bad day, but I bet tomorrow will be better. I'm an eternal optimist. I look at um, the glass half full instead of half empty. One of the things I just, I, I just do. The philosopher. Life is tough sometimes. Things don't always turn out the way we want. The distractor. That doesn't sound good. You know, I have the perfect job for someone like you. Would you mind coming over here? The savior. Tell your teacher it's important for you to improve your grade and ask if you, you would be willing to help if you stayed after school. The investigator. Why do you think the teacher hates your guts? Do you normally do your work? Are you respectful in class? The child advocate. That is very unfair of your teacher. You're a great kid and deserves to be treated the same as everyone else. The adult ally, which we all hope to be. I'm sure your teacher doesn't hate your guts. They probably have high expectations and want you to live up to them. The sympathizers. I'm sorry, I feel really bad for you. The amateur psychologist. Is this paper really what's bothering you? Or are you having issues going on in your life right now? The alternative is what we help kids solve their own problems. Youth, I have a paper to write, but I don't know what I should even bother. The teacher always gives me D's and F's no matter how hard I try. They hate my guts. I don't think they, they I think they want me to fail, but my mind will kill me if I do. So here are some steps that you can take. Listen, say nothing, nod and wait for them to continue. Clarify, it sounds like you feel trapped. Empathize. That's tough position to be in. Empower. What do you think you could do? Advise. Would you like some ideas I have? I was in a similar situation once. Would you like to hear what happened? And see, that's really important. That last part is asking permission to give them advice. And then when they say yes, go ahead and share your advice. And so this is a, a way of giving you tools to be able to work with young people uh, and so that you can build that relationship and not be on the other, the other slides, being the psychologist or, or, or those other things, being a therapist, a parent, you know. But this way we empower the young person to kind of help solve their own problems because that's all we, we want them to be problem solvers just like we found that power. And so I really love this. And this is, this is a great way. And if you're writing these things down, that would be great. But there's more exercises with this. Um, um, so hopefully we'll be able to share these with you in the future. So understanding challenging behavior. What are some of the most frustrating and challenging behaviors you deal with on a daily basis? And so this is more of an interactive thing um, right now. If you can just you know throw something in the chat uh, of some of those things that you've seen. And, um, and Shannon, of course, you'll be able to, um, this is being recorded and you can access some of these slides um, in the near future. But what are some of the challenging behaviors that you've seen that are frustrating you on, the, on a daily basis? We have placing blame on others, avoiding taking ownership of their part, 
very challenging and frustrating uh, to deal with. Thank you for that. Becoming withdrawn, silent treatment. Yeah. That's a great one as well. Being disrespectful, talking back, placing blame on, Tracy agrees. Uh, students apathetic, withdrawn. Oh, they're coming in now, I'm telling you. Not wanting to answer questions. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth, when, you, when, when they become withdrawn and not wanting to answer questions, where are they in their youth development spectrum and, and how can you lean in, right? Rumination and thinking in circles, just being quiet. Owning up to their behavior, but justifying it with but, low expectations of self. These, these are all great. Um, and, the, and just to remember all the skills that we're talking about, how to deal with challenging behaviors are really, um, are really good. Trust is a good one, low expectations of self. And so as we as we move on, we're gonna we're gonna see something here is that you know we want to see what lies beneath these behaviors. Sometimes um, they're the tip of the iceberg, means a small indication of a bigger problem. And so it's just not, you know, um, youth want to be bad or they want to do this, but it's sometimes it it takes this information, this feedback from us to kind of lean in and to make sure that we are doing um, our, our jobs as a mentor uh, to assist them in working through these challenging behaviors. Because guess what? When we were young people, we had challenging behaviors and you wanna think about how you were able to navigate those. Because at the end of the, at the, end of the day, we wanna make sure we show them, you know, what does it look like? You know, when we talk about consequences, right? And, you know, there are natural consequences. Uh, there are not negative and positive consequences. And when you talk about consequences with young people, there are, they are negative consequences and there are positive consequences. And so I really like uh, this cartoon here um, about, you know, um, if, you, if you can see that, um, you know, uh, the cartoon character hitting the thing, it goes up, that didn't work out. All I like how I planned it, <laughs> that, that's funny. And then we have the logical consequences, both negative and positive. Uh, keep your phone calls under 20 minutes or you will lose phone privileges for a day. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, that's a little bit dated, <laughs> you know, because I think that uh, most young people have, um, you know, unlimited plans <laughs> at, at this point on their cell phone privileges. So um, all of that is to say that, you know, applying the search institute strategies, we want to express care, start with empathetic listening, share power, work with a child on creating logical consequences, challenge growth, create logical consequence, provide support, create logical consequence, and then expand possibilities, creating a logical consequence. And also we wanna have positive reinforcement. So praise is the key to using praise effectively are being specific, make your praise as effective as possibly by making it specific. Say who are praising and why? Michael, thank you for putting your homework in the finished folder instead of saying, good job. <laughs> Be specific, let kids know specifically what they did that was praiseworthy immediately. You know, this is something that in, in my own, um, in, my, in working with uh, men, mentees, um, you want to make sure that when you see something, timing is important. Use praise immediately after an appropriate behavior occurs. Delaying praise isn't concrete reinforcement for that behavior and frequently. Uh, make sure praise is frequent, such as common mistake. Praising a behavior once is not enough. Keep praising. Great behaviors keep those great behaviors going. And then also just always remember when you talk about praising, celebrating with them often. Those little things that they do, you wanna make a big deal about it and celebrate. 
Doesn't mean you have to get a, a big cake or buy them a snack or something like that, but just making a big deal about it and say, hey, that's a great job. You know, when that happens again, let me know. And then we can have another celebration. You know, those are great ways of positive reinforcement. And it's something that, you know, you know, I really implemented and also trained on uh, with the mentors um, that I had an opportunity to train. And so I don't know if you have any ideas or any examples of positive reinforcement. You can um, drop them in the chat. You've been so great so far. And the one thing about um, working with young people, right, is that every time you work with them, every day that you see them, every day is a fresh start. You want to start by giving them a clean slate every single day. Just because yesterday was hard day or a young person had a bad week doesn't mean that they're a difficult young person. They're good youth having a hard time at a particular time in their lives, right? Uh, not bad youth giving us a hard time. Each day, try to greet uh, the children with openness, kindness, and grace of a clean slate with no tally of what happened in the past in the bad column. You know, like, oh, you did this, you did that, you did this, you did that, and that wasn't good. Every single day that you interact with a young person, you wanna make sure that it's another time uh, for them to have a really uh, great interaction with you and give them a clean slate. Just remember what happened, uh, just forget what happened uh, yesterday. And I think that it goes a long way if, as adults uh, that are supposed to be regulated in our emotions. And we had a thing about emotional intelligence earlier that we are able to do that on purpose uh, to give those young people a clean slate. And so um, that is just something I wanna emphasize here. And it's something that I talked many mentors off the ledge after talking about the challenges they've had with their mentees, that they're not interested. We had a goal of them not going to the office this week. They went to the office twice this week instead of one time. And it's really about, okay, that happened, right? But just engage them um, with a clean slate every time that you meet with them, okay? And now we come to the part, one of my favorite parts of the everyday mentoring and these in this training is to engage youth um, by discovering what they love, right? So this is an exercise and this is something that you have to engage with me on. So I want you to think about a young person with whom you have a strong relationship right now. So that person, lock that person in your mind. It could be your child, it could be a niece, nephew, it could be somebody you're mentoring, it could be a student. Just think about that strong relationship that you have with that person, that one person that you want, that you that you have a connection with. Okay, and so when you have that person locked in, give me a thumbs up in the in the um, in the chat once you have that. Right. I don't see no thumbs up, so I'm gonna wait. All right, I'm starting to see some thumbs up, okay. Yes, great, all right. So since you have that young, that young person in your mind, what are the things that spark their interest? What are their passions or curiosity? You know this person and you should know what sparks their interest. And you can just put those things in the chat. We don't know the young person. You could just share riding their bike. Oh, and I love riding my bike. Animals. Dancing. Foodie. Crafts. Baseball. Art, clothing, video games. Writing. Entrepreneurship. 
you know, when you think about that young person, you it immediately comes to mind because you have that relationship with that, with that young person. You know what sparks them, what's something they're interested in, something they would do hours on end if, uh, if left to their own devices. And so the research shows that kids who can identify a spark, right, have a purpose, are more socially competent, more physically healthy. We have bike riding, for instance, volunteer more, get higher grades and have higher, better attendance, less likely to be depressed or participate in at-risk behaviors, place greater importance on being connected to school and making contribution to society. And so, you know, and when you look at the, and when you, and when you look at what's on the screen, we have all types of things here, arts, pottery, football, cooking, theater, science, reading, school, debate, fashion, ballet, piano, baseball, swimming, computers, guitar, design, hiking, golf, games, animals, hockey, the list is so broad. And there are some things that are not listed here, right? Some things that you put like entrepreneurship, there's a passion for a young person that, that, that loves entrepreneurship. So this is where a mentor can come in and help them discover what they love. And it's really their spark, what makes them, what makes them happy. So the research on sparks, right? There, there's a there's some there's some research behind this. Um, sparks are the interests and passions young people have that light a fire in their lives and express the essence of who they are and what they offer to the world. So helping a young helping young people identify and pursue sparks is a critical to their development. And I know this is a new thing for our mentors to really focus about because a lot of times, especially in the school-based mentoring space, we're looking at chronic absenteeism, we're looking at um, academic um, engagement, but you know, also what makes them happy, right? Kids with sparks have better outcomes and the more sparks, the better. So we wanna be able to dig in and see what they are. And we have a whole a bunch of exercise and tools to really bring that out. We're not sharing them now, this is a, a, an overview, but for this section of uh, the research on sparks, there's a lot. And then how can we help identify and encourage their sparks? That's our job, right? That's part of our job is to make sure that when we, when we find that, uh, we help them. And one of the things that, um, one, of the, one of the things I talk about when we talk about sparks is that um, when I was a young person, I did boxing, I boxed. And I remember listening and hearing about a, a young boxer, amateur boxer coming up uh, named um, Mike Tyson out of Caskill, New York. And so we heard about him in our gym when we went to go, we talked, you know, about the fights and, you know, Mike Tyson is going to be fighting near us. We want to go see, he's a really great amateur boxer. And so I was introduced to him before he became a, a famous heavyweight, but when he was golden gloves, silver mittens like I was. And so, you know, that was my spark. But one of the things that um, his trainer and coach and mentor said, custom model said that he didn't walk into the gym that way. So what he helped him do was uh, discover and uncover that love for boxing. He became, you know, if you know anything about Mike Tyson, um, he's a, a boxing historian and he was very good at boxing. But um, discovering and uncovering is something I want to leave you with is because you want to discover and uncover what they love and help them cultivate that because that's kind of our job is to help that young person find their passion, what they're good at, because they might not be able to do this, right? They're having challenges in school, but they can do this. And we want to, you know, really um, light a fire under them and help them realize that. How to encourage sparks, right? You know, how do we encourage sparks? Um, ask questions about their interests. Notice what they seem to like and be good at just naturally, right? Uh, find resources for them, eliminate obstacles, connect with their interests in future careers, create a vision board. I like that exercise, creating a vision board. Outline the steps needed to achieve goals, plan backwards. What was someone who achieved your goal 
doing at your age to prepare, right? These are, these are great. Positive predicting. How will it feel when you achieve this? Celebrate accomplishments. There's that celebrate again. Uh, model your own sparks. You know, when we were young people, uh, we had those sparks and those things that we love and share that with them and, and tell them how successful you were in that, okay? So one of the things we have, a, I mean, when we talk about um, everyday mentoring, it's this approach um, is that we all can do this because we all have these positive relationships that we can nurture. And it doesn't take a lot, you know, it doesn't take much. But we want to make sure that we take care of ourselves, right? And how do we do that? We maintain healthy boundaries. Uh, do you have boundaries that are too loose when it comes to young people? Uh, have realistic expectations. Uh, do you have any unrealistic expectations that you will achieve? And then practice self-care. And we talk about this time and time again. Uh, where in your life could you treat yourself better so you can continue having something to give? And, you know, I remember working in a maximum security detention center and the, the supervisor told me that, you know, when you leave out of this place, you want to forget everything behind, the, you want to leave everything behind so that when you come in for your shift next time, you have something to get. And so that's something that we want to be able to do, you know, um, when we talk about that. And so uh, with that, um, we can go ahead. And if you have any um, reflect, any reflections and anything that I can leave you with, um, you can put those in the chat really quickly. And let me open the chat up so I can receive those. So what did you think about what we talked about so far? We talked about sparks. Uh, we talked about, you know, uh, boundaries, what everyday mentoring is. Um, everybody can be an everyday mentor. You know, this everyday mentoring started with a bunch of school cro crossing guards uh, because they had a touch point with young people every single day and they were able to get these tools to build mentoring relationships with those young people. So it's really the sky's the limit when we talk about giving tools to um, adults that wanna have caring relationships uh, with young people. So let's recap what we've gone through so far today in this overview of everyday mentoring. Keep in the back of your mind that you may be one of the only caring adults in a kid's life. Always remember that. There are many ways to be a great mentor to young people. There's different ways. There's new information that we can learn. Assess your strengths in working with youth and consider ways to improve. Set healthy boundaries for yourself and others. Listen with your full attention, eyes, ears, and heart. Support youth to face their own challenges and bring your time together to, to a close by focusing on the positive. Very nice, very nice presentation. Yes, and our last thing here, <laughs> the most important thing we need to communicate to our kids our actions and our words. What is right with you is far more powerful than what is wrong with you. That's a great quote, um, a great quote. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and allow uh, Joe to share hers. I think that's a really powerful quote, to be honest, um, and, and a great, way to end the session on everyday mentoring. Thank you for taking the time to, to put together the presentation and share it so eloquently. Uh, very important model for us all to learn and, and we can incorporate it to really you know, support the youth who are in our lives. Um, and that's, that's wonderful. I uh, would like to um, introduce Roland Harmon, who is the co-president of the Governor's Prevention Partnership. He would like to uh, talk to you a little bit about some, some issues that, that we're facing. Roland, would you like to, I will share my screen for the last part as Roland's 
speaking. Okay. Well, thank well, thank you, Joe, and and to for pulling this uh, this opportunity for us, this learning opportunity. You can take me off. I want to see everybody. Um, let me see here. Okay. Yeah, want to just thank everybody for your participation today and you setting this this time aside. We know this is a somewhat sacred time, right? When you can get away and steal away and, and participate in learning opportunities, but uh, not just learning opportunity, but also ways that you can uh, impact and, and, and you know influence and, and share your knowledge and experience with all of us and we all learn and share together. So really want to thank you for that and you know for our day and uh, reflections from the field and uh, mentoring with purpose, all of the things that help protect our young people and the work that you all are doing on the front lines. We, we so appreciate it. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that, um, you know, we are, we are all still, you know, concerned and uh, impacted by the recent event that uh, has taken place uh, in uh, Uvalde, Texas. Uh, and, and the mass uh, shooting there at um, the school there. And these things are just happening all too often and, and becoming somewhat familiar and, and almost commonplace, uh, so to speak. And so, and that's on top of the violence that occurs in our neighborhoods and our communities each and every day, whether that's gun violence. And uh, I know in New Haven some time ago, and, and even recently, uh, there's, they're um, losing young people to gun violence. Um, what happened in Buffalo, uh, New York, uh, the mass shooting there, and then also in California. And these things just seem to keep happening over and over and over again. And, and we're all doing all we can to, to protect our young people, make sure that they're safe and free from these types of threats. But safety is an issue and there's anxiety and, and, um, and there's fear um, and there's uh, unreadiness and doubt are schools safe? Um, you know, I'm sending my my child off to school, putting them on the bus, and reservations about that. And so we want to pause next week and take some time to process. Uh, we thought that was something we would be able to do today. Our team mobilized extremely quickly um, and got everything in order to do a, a courageous conversation, rapid response conversation this evening for eight o'clock, eight p.m., so that we would be able to. Uh, uh, listen to parents and then share some strategies and resources and moving through conversations yet again with our young people about what's transpiring and what's happening. I was uh, the other day, Tuesday, when it happened, sitting in the family room. I, um, I work, uh, my office space is down here in the family room. And after that, I, I try to do a little something. So I, I, I was watching the news. And uh, my daughter came downstairs and granddaughter, four years old, came and, it, and some of the events were unfolding. And I immediately said, oh, we're changing the channel, right? Because it's that trauma and that exposure to what's happening, even at four years old, um, that young people are, are seeing and experiencing. So, um, you know, we have to filter things and shut some of the television off and shut some of the social media channels down, you know, to continue to protect our young people. But, at the same time, you know, there's going to be that exposure to it, and uh, having the tools and resources to move through these conversations so that young people feel heard um, and they have assurances that uh, we are doing all we can to protect them. Uh, and so we are going to work through some of those conversations, and it's just a start, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. I think you talked about that, Yaris D, right? Um, there, we know that there are some systemic and more broader implications. And, and there's there's more work to be done. Um, and so as we will be champions of, of peace, of champions of love, champions of hope in the midst of situation that is just awful uh, in terms of what is happening um, and what parents and families are dealing with in, in Texas, in Buffalo, in California, and, and in many cases in our local communities. And so we hope that you will join us. We will be putting out a, a date. We are looking at June 1st uh, from 8 to 9 p.m. And so um, just want to keep those families in our thoughts and prayers. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Joe. Thank, Thank you, you Roland. Uh, it's, it's very sobering to, to see a young person, all right, both the, the shooter and the victims 
most of them, uh, 19 of the victims and the shooter were all young people that we need to serve better, I think, as a country. We need to serve our youth better. And that's what um, today's school-based school -based mentoring is all about. How do we, as caring, supportive adults, support our young, uh, our youth better? And um, so we have uh, a closing session that is brief, but I would invite you all to put on your videos if you feel comfortable so that we can have more of an interactive session um, closing. And I would like to in invite Kermit Carolina from New, ha New Haven Public Schools who is a, a leader in the field. He's worked with in education. He's been the principal of schools. He's been the supervisor. He works every day with um, teachers and professionals and, and students and both in his in the school system and in his community. Uh, Kermit, um, would you like to? I, I've got to find you on my little thing here. I, Kermit, do you want to turn on your video? Yep, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. But full disclosure, full disclosure, I'm sitting in a restaurant now. So just so you know, I was a, I was a principal all day while listening as a principal. And I, I was out eating lunch, listening to the entire conversation and taking notes. Um, so you hear a little background noise, know that I've moved and I'm, I'm, I'm here now. I haven't had lunch today. Okay. But, um, but, but, but I want to share some things. There were some, some key points. I want to say ditto number one. So Roland, um, I, I really appreciated your words. Um, I think they were spot on. Um, some things that uh, I really um, heard today uh, from Kathy Lee, for instance, um, uh, and 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 uh, Doctor, uh, I can't remember her name. I was Doctor um, Doctor Stern. Um, I, I mean, just when we talk about the social emotional aspect, the things that kids are going through, uh, that that you know they walk into school buildings and really adults don't identify a lot of times we don't identify um that they're having a problem and i think that's so important that as mentors and people who are working with young people we identify we we, we may not have the skill set to the kind of diagnose what it is but we need to make sure we connect them to the right supports to receive um uh, the support they need because if not the, the issues obviously you know they're going to fester uh, the second thing I'm going to say is I want to follow up on something Aristide said, which is about listening. Uh, and I, I took it I'm, and, and, and being present because I think young people need to be listened to. I think uh, Roland kind of alluded to that as well. We have to be present when young people are talking to us because we don't know who's listening to them at home. We don't know what kind of problems they're having. And they're really looking for trusted ears and people who can help them solve problems. And, you know, there's nothing worse than a kid who's suffering that has no one to speak with. Um, and, you know, we, we see all kinds of behaviors, uh, anti-social behaviors take place as a result of that, um, nationally and locally. Um, I would just add to that being available. I think another key point for me is, you know, it's important that we be available as mentors and that we're reliable. I, I found in the 30 years that I've been doing mentorship and I've, I've been a basketball coach, uh, uh, a teacher, principal, I've worked with kids in my neighborhood, and I think the most effective thing, I think the thing that they, they always tell me is that I'm always, I've always been there for them and reliable. And, and when you think about becoming a mentor, you really just understand it. Sometimes it, it could become a lifetime commitment, depending on the kid. Um, a lot of kids, they go on, they grow up to do great things. Some don't go grow up to do, do great things. I get phone calls from kids uh, who are now adults that, are, that own businesses or they're in college, and it's a great thing. I get calls from kids in prison who tell me they need their, my, my support when they come home. These are all kids that, you know, we, we, we've developed connections with, but the fact that they're thinking about me and they think about us as, as mentors, I think is we, we have to hold on to that. And um, I think it's important that we're available. Um, raising expectation. Uh, Iris, you talked about sparks. Uh, I think that one of the biggest things we can do, and what, what worked for me, what, what brought me, brought me into education, was I had my mentor, uh, Ms. Wanda Gibbs, who's uh, one of the most outstanding principals New Haven's ever seen. Um, and she said to me, you are great at, and for me it was, I was great at relating with kids. I was great with the, being an administrator, doing administrative things. 
And she said, I, she said, her words were, I think you should explore becoming a, and she mentioned administrator principal and she set me on my, on my track. And I was a young guy at that time. So we, we don't, your words have power as a mentor. Right. Kids who trust you can hear you and your words have power um, in your praise. Um, last uh, three things. Helping young people have the courage to be different. In this society, they, so many kids follow other kids and we have to help them understand how to deal with peer pressure and give them strategies to do that. And as, as the people that they trust as adults, that's very important. So having the courage to be different. The other thing is choosing friends. Um, we have to help them develop a social circle, what that social look, circle looks like. Lions don't walk with sheep, I tell young people all the time, and eagles don't fly with chickens. In fact, chickens can't fly. So be careful of who you're around, and you want to be around people who are on the same mission you're on. Very important. Show me your friends, and I'll tell you who you are. Show me your friends, and I'll tell you your future. Um, the other thing is encouraging them to be in nurturing environments. Uh, I think um, someone talked today about the, the the positive aspects of being involved in sports, the math club and other events, when they're around other young people who are doing positive things, it keeps them on that track. And so that we have to make sure that not only when they're, when they're not around us, if we can connect them with other positive activities, very important. And then last but not least, which is a, a different form of mentoring to some degree, it's helping them develop cabinets of support. And what I mean by that is, President Obama, President Biden, even President Trump, all of them had a cabinet of people who they relied on for advice. And I think the best thing we can do for young people is help them identify key adults in their life that they can turn to when they need support, that they can call for advice. And not everyone's going to be available to go pick a kid up for an hour or two and spend time with them, but they can be available to pick up a phone or respond to a text. So I think that it's important that we find people who can be mentors and help them as they seek, um, uh, they go on, they get on track towards their future goals um, and the things in their dreams. So those are the things that I wanted to kind of just reiterate and, and obviously the trust factor. So I want to thank everyone and I'm going to pass this back to uh, Joe and thank all of you for your, uh, your knowledge today, your wisdom. Uh, I've taken a lot of notes and I really appreciate you guys. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your, your wisdom also and your, your willingness to share it with us. I want to open it up. Um, we, we've been here for a, a long afternoon with a lot, of, a lot of information. What are your thoughts? What are your takeaways from, from today? Anyone? You can, you can hold down, if you're muted, you can unmute yourself by just holding down the space bar while you talk. But let's, let's end it with, with a sharing. Very quiet. <laughs> well, well, Joe, I'll get us kicked off. I'd like to mention, and I'd like to um, revisit uh, a comment that uh, Kermit made, which I think is, is so key and important. And I think it's uh, appropriate for uh, this, this whole day in terms of, you know, he, 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 Kermit, you mentioned that a, a mentor may not, may, may not be able to do the full two hours, but there's other ways that we can connect with young people, right? And I think that looking at, while there is, yes, evidence and there is science, mentoring is rooted in science, it's rooted in evidence, and, and there are the formal processes of for mentoring, right? That one hour minimum of week, that year long commitment, all those things that we are, we hold to, um, I think expanding and looking at non-traditional ways and then looking at how we support um, adults everywhere that are, um, that are holding up young people and, and, and standing by them and ensuring them up in non-traditional ways, ways that we may say, oh, that's a little different, but is it, is it bringing out positive outcomes? And it's about that connection so students, continue, young people continue to be engaged and they have that resource, that, that social network. So um, I think expanding that, I think at the partnership, we have an opportunity to kind of lift that up uh, in, in ways that, um, you know, it could, it, it could be the church, you know, that, that's doing some work that may not have a formal mentoring program, but that, that mother of that church has taken 15 young women under her wing. And so how do we support her and her efforts? Um, and she does it the way that she does it. And it's credible. And the community recognizes it. 
and so how do we support and uh, provide some scaffolding and and resources to those uh, groups that may not necessarily fit our normal description of a um, traditional mentoring program. If I could share the three things, three things that really jumped out at me today. Um, Dr. Weinberger said, uh, mentoring programs can't do it on their own, right? She was talking about how throughout the history of uh, school-based mentoring in this country, it's really been businesses, corporations, and you know others outside of the schools who are helping to form these, uh, these programs, mentors from these, these businesses coming in and helping the, the students. So mentoring programs can't do it on their own. And I think the, the whole theme of, of everyday mentoring also points out the importance of relationships. And I think everything Kermit was saying, both at the beginning of the day and at the end, the bookends for this conference are mentoring relationships are key. Young people need good, positive, supportive relationships. And you don't have to make that lifetime commitment to be a mentor. You can, you can be a, a, a mentor in the context of what you're doing. If you're a teacher, you're a mentor. If you're a neighbor, you're a mentor. You know, when I look at my life, it was it was teachers who really were more mentoring to me than anyone. I never had anyone through a formal program be a mentor, but I certainly wouldn't have been able to achieve what I have in my life without having had teachers and other people step up and help me in this very everyday mentoring type of of uh, way and that mentors have tools that they you know everything Aristide was talking about there are a whole set of tools that we use to help young people deal with the challenges in their lives if they're dealing with the fact that they they live in a community that where there is um, substance use and drugs being sold on the street that that may contain really dangerous substances that, that they're unaware of. And they may be just kids trying to have fun and, and they ingest something that, that could kill them, you know, could literally take their life that quickly. Uh, when you, you talk about um, kids growing up in, in homes that, where there's mental health issues and challenges and poverty and racism, these are all challenges that our young people face. And mentors are the solution, or at least are a powerful part of the solution to helping them overcome some of those challenges. And when our young overcome those challenges, that's when our society and our communities become better. That's when we start to chip away at the social inequities that taint our society, that create many of the problems that we, we struggle with as, as Americans. And so, um, that's my my soapbox for today. Uh, that's what I take away from from this day. How about you, Wendy? Do you have anything to add? No, I I was as you were speaking, Joe. I'm also reminded today uh, that mentoring is a two way street, and there's so many things that we learn from our mentees as a mentor. And I think that um, you know part of our challenge then is to reach out to our communities and recognize that so many adults in our communities do have so much to share um, and don't feel that they can be a mentor. They don't have the tools. They don't think that they have the capability of being a mentor. What can I provide? But I think, you know, so many, there, we have so many resources right in our own communities, regardless of where we are in, in our, within our state. Uh, so one of the challenges we have is to continue to reach out to our community, reach deeper into our community and, and really, tap into those resources, those other caring adults that are there um, and reassure them that they do have the tools. We can help them through the process. And at the same time, they will continue to grow and to learn from their mentees. They will likely learn just as much from them as their mentees will learn from the mentors. That's fantastic. You're reminding us, uh, reminding me of the conversations that 
that Susan and Aristide and I had with some mentors when we were a few months ago. And there are there are people who are out there being mentors. You know, they got it. They know they got the qualities, but they they somehow don't have the confidence to see themselves as mentors. Somehow that 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 title is too big for them. So we've got to we've got to share the the power that they have. Anyone else? Anyone who who is listening? I think Kermit was jumping in there for a minute. Okay, I'm sorry, Kermit. Oh no, that's okay. I, I just wanted to say uh, how great it was to listen to uh, Dr. Weinberger. Also, I didn't know that uh, I hadn't known that about her being a pioneer of school-based mentoring and Norwalk having such a uh, a great history around that. That was exciting to hear. Um, you know, so I just want to thank her for all that she's done uh, and the groundwork that she laid. Uh, in her presentation today and everyone else who came on behind her. I think that was important to hear as well. Um, I, and, and, I, and I was going to double down on the, Joe, you said something about relationships and I, I just, um, and someone else just mentioned it again and said it, but I, um, I think caring, right? That gets overlooked, right? The first thing young people, if we know anything about young people, they observe us when we're talking to them for the first time or the first few times, they're looking to, they're there, they're doing an analysis. And they really are quick to pick up on BS, meaning if we're not sincere about caring, they tune us out immediately. But the minute they recognize that we truly care and that we're honest and we're, we're going to be honest with them and say what needs to be said, but we're going to be there to help them through it, they instantly lock in. So I can't stress the importance of in building that relationship. It starts with caring. You don't care what color you are. It doesn't start with that. The, the color and your ethnicity comes into play later on if anything if you want to go to a deeper level to talk about some some shared experiences but in general kids want support from caring adults and how we show that is very important uh and, and the last thing i'm going to say is uh and this is specific to black and latino males um the one thing that gets normalized uh and and doesn't get uh identified enough is the um, the feelings of abandonment and the feelings of being unsafe um that that they experience and and because the world teaches us to be macho you know and you know not show weaknesses and not show those things a lot of times it doesn't show but it comes out in the form of different behaviors when kids reach school the and i think jawanza can who said it best he says you know um the, the, a kid's I, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing um you know a kid the biggest challenges that black and latino males are there's not biology it's not math it's not english social studies or any of the other classes that they have the biggest challenge they had is they have is the walk from home to school and back home every day and and the feelings of of what kind of violence they might come across and whether they're going to make it home safely or not and like how they and, and feeling unprotected uh and and especially if they don't have a parent at home one of their parents is missing from the home particularly if it's a father so i just want us to keep that in the back of our heads too as we think about because that group is the group that's, that just statistically is losing the battle in every area. And we have to begin to look a little deeper at that. I don't want that to become normalized either. Any, any more than I want these shootings that are taking place nationally to be normalized. We have to, we have to be very sensitive to the needs of Black and Latino males and what they're experiencing right now. So I just want to thank you. That's my last words. I'm listening yeah, to this week. I, I think you. those are great last words for the conference, uh, for the showcase also. Uh, we're we're towards the the end. Thank you so much, and thank you for those of you who stuck around for for the very end. I want to remind you that there are um, feedback surveys that you will get when you're finished with the session, and I ask you to please um, fill them out. The information really helps us to to know where we're doing good and where we need to do better, and we're always striving to do better. There should be for this session, both one that is for the presentation on everyday mentoring and one for the overall showcase. So um, I'm not sure if they'll come as one survey with both sets of questions or two surveys. So, so please, um, if you, you don't see all the questions, there, there would be about eight if they were all together. Uh, look for a second survey, please. And please fill it out. And thank you for coming. And um, be sure to check us out on uh, the various social media platforms that we're on. 
if you go to our website, you'll see, uh, I know somebody um, at one point, I think in, in Aristide's presentation, asked about where the trainings are. So I put in the chat, the link to our website where we have a, a very long and growing list of opportunities that are all free to uh, learn about a variety of prevention and mentoring subjects. So um, please, uh, please check it out. You'll also find a place to register for the rapid response conversation that, that, that um, Roland was talking about. Okay. So with that, have a blessed day and evening and a, a peaceful uh, holiday weekend. Okay. May it be blessed. All right. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, guys. Great job, everyone. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you. Bye, everybody.